And we're live. All right. When you think about documentation, that is what this episode is about. What do you think? RTFM? Read the effing manual? You know, user doc documentation in the in the context of software is more than just user documentation. Yes, user documentation, good end user documentation is super important for making sure that your project is successful. But that's not the only thing that makes software great. And I will posit to you that what makes a good project just good and a great project even better has a lot to do with the quality of the documentation that it has. <clears throat> that that <laughs> that it has, as I said before. And we're not just talking about user documentation. We're talking about developer docs, having good documentation that allows developers to come in and be productive, having good examples, having clear cut um, descriptions of APIs and how to use them, ex uh, good explanations of workflow. And on top of that, making sure that users have a way to share information and to reconcile issues that they run into through properly documented support sites, properly documented support procedures in which you can get answers to your questions. Now, that I will say is still not sufficient. When you're dealing with open source and open source projects like Major Software uh, and Major JS, specifically Media Software is the company, Media JS is the project. One of the other things I would say is having sufficient comments and information in your code, having module comments and descriptions, having function comments so that you have a better understanding of what's going on with it. And for those of you who say that, you know, we don't necessarily need these things because I have self-documenting code. I write self-documenting code. I think we're going to argue with you on this one a little bit. And later on in the program, we will talk more about this. You'll notice that there's an overall theme today in all the news that we do. And it's going to have this documentation focus. But on top of that, we will be talking about other projects. And we'll be doing a demo a little later. Uh, Cooster is not here with us today, and you'll see that in a bit. But we'll be doing a demo and uh, showing you how you can deploy your applications on the different options that you have and pointing to the documentation that tells you this. So without further ado, I want to just share with you that this is episode 36, and you're watching or listening to This Week in Meteor JS, a weekly newscast of the Media Dispatches podcast intended for both new and returning MediaJS users. Our program is brought to you by MediaJS community ambassadors who share information, events, activities, and other newsworthy items. I'm your host, Alim Gafar, streaming to you live from New York City. Hello, everybody. I'm Jan Brak, aka Storyteller, streaming to you from Prague, Czechia. And as we always do, We'll jump straight to the news. All right. I'll start with some quick meter news. Let's jump right in. And that is that we work meteor.com, which many might have thought has been dead or no longer maintained, is back online and it's uh, sponsored by Meteor Software. So if you have any job opportunities or are looking for job opportunities in Meteor, this is the page to go to to find you know, what, there, what work can you do with Meteor itself. And that's pretty much it for the news for this week. We have, if you follow in detail the or if you follow the development, we have a lot of merges going into Meteor 3 as, as it moves slowly towards uh, release scanning one, but nothing new uh, on that site. And I will not bother you here with the details of every pull request. <laughs> but I will jump now to uh, 
just say updates from a bit more high up and that is from all the way up into the JavaScript engine and that's that's a V8 uh, and that is what runs the JavaScript in Node, in Chrome and so on. And recently there has been, or pretty much always there are some updates uh, going on in this. And Antonio Zanini in his article on February 28th has uh, summarized a few of them. And uh, pretty much there are some new uh, features. Uh, let me scroll up here that you can take uh, advantage of. I think interestingly here are the two well-formed or is well-formed uh, functions, which especially in regards to, if we look here on MDN, they are in regards to the text that you know you put in, it will tell you, or it will format it in a way that it won't crash other functions that might rely that the string is well-formed, like the uh, encode URI uh, function and so on. So that's now, of course, in Lightest Note 20 and, of course, in the browsers. Let me, yes, here we go. So here is a sample of how that works. Just take some wrong uh, string and it will format it at least in question mark. Or in the case of a smiley, it will add the emoticon there. So encode nice. is one of those thing. Uh, but uh, of course, or maybe not but, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of, uh, of course, uh, new improvements, especially when it comes to performance. So that's a quite a constant, let's say, I would say theme through this article, new performance improvements, new features uh, in regards to web assembly, for example, this one in regards to garbage uh, collection. And you can see here, you know, some minor speed improvements mm -hmm. under specific scenarios. And let me double check my notes. And uh, yes, and I think for interestingly here are is the faster HTML parser and DOM allocation. So that should help uh, a lot, especially in the browsers to make things run faster. And yes, I really like this uh, number eight here, memory handling optimizations through compile time, constant addresses, uh, which should speed up the uh, the JavaScript because it, uh, in the compile process, it will statically link uh, you know, things like undefined and true variables to the memory, so it will not have to do the lookup uh, later on. So that will save uh, the time in uh, on performance because it doesn't have to do the lookup look, you know, for where is the memory because not, okay, it's exactly over here in this memory. I don't have to run through my usual functions to find it. So that's uh, what's going on in the V8 engine. If we uh, jump now between Meteor and V8, we have uh, had a security release on April 10th for versions 18, 20, and 21 of Node.js. It pertains to the chill process dot spawn. So if we look into the documentation, you can find all about it there. And this is especially when it comes to multi-threading, uh, multi-threading node applications. So that's kind of a serious uh, say issue that could be taken care of, but it has been already patched. And we had node 20.12.2. And I do believe I just, earlier today, I saw a pull request for the Meteor 3 branch to include this uh, node node release there as well so it will be a meteor 3 as well so those are the news um on node.js and alan 
This yeah. doesn't look like the Node.js website that I remember. What no, has no, here? not at all. As a matter of fact, it's gone through some improvements and it's been an incremental set of improvements that have been happening over time on it. There is an article um, on the Node website that is written by Brian Munzen, Musenmeyer. <clears throat> I may have mispronounced his name. I hope I haven't done too bad a job on it. Um, where he walks through the activities that they have taken over, I guess, um, a little more than a year, uh, talking about some of the redesigns that they've done on the Node website. Um, much of it for just the sense that they wanted to grow up as a website. It's something that uh, had not really had a proper design uh, in the past. It was just developers that, that used their intuition and, and built the application, built the site the way they thought. And um, and so it's a really interesting story <clears throat> or a really useful story from the point of view of it. It explains the evolution of how they went from the old site to the site that you're now using. And they even plan out some new additions and fixes that they're going to go on with for the rest of the year. Some of the things that they were interested in was light speed performance, which is the tools that you get on Chrome that tells you whether or not your page is loading fast. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, SEO compatible. And so they wanted to make sure that they hit those specs. The other thing too, I believe, is one of the issues that they had was discoverability. And they wanted to make sure that there was uh, better discoverability with <coughs> the um, site. So most of the changes that have been made were in, you know, were shooting for improvements in performance and uh, the design experience for the user experience. Now, there is something that I'm missing here because I was about to uh, mention it. I'm going to just look over by my notes for a second here and see if I can find what it is. Ah, for us, <clears throat> for the media community, there is a lesson that is also learned here. One of the things that was mentioned was how they were able to get more involvement and uh, try to time some of the work that they were doing in terms of improvements to the Grace Hopper uh, anniversary uh, last year, and then of course, Hacktober Hacktoberfest last year. And they set up a campaign in which they uh, reached out to the community and said, hey, you know, if you are interested in doing some small task that can help us out and we'll enumerate those, um, then you know you can you can make a commit to an open source project and you have involvement in it. And they felt that that was actually successful. And they describe in, in better detail than I'm doing right now what was involved in getting that there. So I just want to point this out because I think it's an article worth reading. Again, it's called Diving into the Node.js website redesign. You can find that at the Node.js website blog. So if you go to the Node.js website, there is a link to the blog and you can click on that there. And the author is Brian Munzenmeyer. Munzenmeyer. Uh, am I pronouncing that correctly, Jan? I mean, I think you probably. Enough. Okay. <laughs> How would you say it? Munzenmeyer. I would say Munzenmeyer, yeah. Okay. So. He does it much more smoothly than I do, and uh, that's what there is to it. So, I think it's it's uh, this is an example when we're talking about documentation of documenting the process that there is a big project that that it took and allowing it to do things like celebrate the achievements and the work of the people that are on the team that worked on this, that put effort into it, and also explaining the decisions that they made to get to where they are. And I think this is also a great way that projects, especially open source projects, can um, use documentation to elevate the work that they're doing. And by the way, even though this is open source and because it's a way of being accountable to the community, it doesn't mean that in a private company you couldn't do something similar so that the rest of the people in the company understand the effort that goes into doing what needs to be done for a particular project and why you made some of the technical decisions that you made along the way. It can actually help you um, be a better communicator that way. All right.
enough of that. Do you have any any comments on this article? Did you read the article? Did you get a chance? Or yes, I, I, I skimmed through it. Uh, what I really like is how kind of they describe why they choose, why they chose it. You also notice some of uh, I could say meteor related projects like storybooks and chromatic. Yep. And I'm kind of curious. I'll be looking into the Orama uh, search that they have been using. See maybe Excellent. if that might be something of uh, of use to us. Well, of, of probably or maybe uh, for some of my other projects as well. Okay. Uh, speaking of documenting the process, also recently there has been a Node.js documentary about the origins of oh. uh, Node.js itself. It follows from a previous documentary uh, about Ruby on Rails, uh, mm -hmm. and that one has been created by a channel called Honeypot. So. A bit suspicious name, I'll admit. A little bit. But I'll post these. Uh, I'll just I'll post the panel on Node.js into the chat, so you can guys uh, take a look. Uh, it's definitely something I'll be probably watching this evening to get some idea. Speaking of uh, new releases, Astro has also released version four point five. And mm. which has some quite few interesting uh, features that I want to highlight. One of them, or kind of the first one, big one, is Dev Audit UI, uh, which, uh, from my understanding, is as you code and work on your, you know, on your app, if there's like some issue. So, for example, you are missing alt description for for your image or anything else that could affect, for example, say the Lighthouse score or performance is going to get highlighted. And as you can see in the example here, it's going to tell you uh, where it is, what was the issue there. So, and potentially the effect of things. So I found it super interesting uh, and definitely something to look forward to. Part of it, I think, if I remember correctly, Astro is uh, React-based, so uh, having that, oh, you know, kind of, or and it's also very opinionated, so having that helps in determining these, uh, you know, making these determinations. So, but definitely, you know, something very cool to maybe hopefully have something similar to Meteor in the future, at least for the Meteor-related stuff. Uh, another big one. Uh, specifically that we can also look uh, for inspiration. We have talked a lot with collections uh, too about JSON schemas, uh, and they have now in Astro 4.5 added experimental uh, JSON schema for data collections generation so that they can be reused in, of course, auto-completion, validation, documentation, and many other things. So. We'll be watching, I think, this a uh, little bit more closely, especially in relations with collection, to uh, to see if maybe the approach is something similar that you might want to get inspired by for collection two. And I think the point to make here is, although we've talked about Astro in the past, and although Astro is not something that you can really use with Meteor, it's really important to stay on top of what's going on in adjacent fields so that you could see what innovations people are are working with and see whether or not Meteor could, could use them. Yeah. Another interesting thing is, uh, which could have been potentially considered, is that uh, they have built their own uh, documentation, mm -hmm. say, say engine, but you know, framework based on Astro hmm. called Starlight. And that's definitely something that I have been looking into uh, as well when looking for documentation. So it's supported by Astro. It has different languages and some of the other uh, goodies. So this is, uh, I would say, quite a nice uh, you know, documentation to kind of take a look at when you know, kind of looking for what what you want to how where you want to build your uh, documentations on. 
That's excellent. Uh, there's a lot of new stuff going on here, and you know, it's yeah. There has been a lot of a lot of new documentation, um, let's say, frameworks that have mm -hmm. popped up uh, quite recently, uh, which. I'm not really sure how to feel about it because we are we had there has been a long time nothing. Uh yep. then you know there, you had there was like Hexo, uh then you know DocuSaurus was kind of the big first one that many have started switching to. And sure. now it looks like everybody is doing their own uh engine, even freaking WebStorm has <laughs> you know their their own that they've built that you can easily integrate. Yeah. So well, and then there are these online ones that have been around forever, like Read the Docs, right? So, yes, you know, it's it's terrific that we have these things. What I think is more important is whether or not projects are using them, whether or not you are using them. And, um, you know, they do help make it a little easier. You just focus on the writing rather than the entire, like, how am I going to structure this? But it's, uh, it's cool yeah. to see. Yeah, well, it's for me. It's right now trying a bit more difficult because before, like, it was like, okay, let's you know use Docker server some other stuff. And now, uh, the choices have seriously expanded. And you know, it doesn't mean that there was just Docker servers, but like other options that were quite valid as well. But Docker services kind of at one point become the de facto standard that everybody right. go to. And now it seems like it has been shattered and. Uh, there's some very good other options as well. Yeah. And it seems like everybody's running their own. So uh kind of makes me, you know, uh, a bit nervous when you know choosing what what to do for my documentations and other yeah. things. I kind of want to wait a little bit to see which ones are going to kind of win in this battle. Mm -hmm. Uh but that can uh, you know that will probably last much longer than I uh, can afford to wait. I remember when I was at Meteor Software, um, we were using Favro, um, which is just a online shared doc uh, for uh, for collaboration, um, and making some of those documents public, and then just you know you could just get a URL to it, and and do that. And then we had to migrate from Favro to something else. I forget what it was that we eventually moved on to, but uh, it's. I, I see your point, which is when you make that decision, you know, you also have to think about, you know, what happens if you migrate in the future, whether or not the project that you're on or you've adopted has has a future and it's got legs, whether or not it'll stick around. Um, all of those are, are decisions to make. In some cases, people might say, why don't you just, you know, use uh, Markdown and GitHub Docs <laughs> just on its own? Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and just go with that. And that can be a solution too. So it depends on what problem you're trying to solve by adopting one of these frameworks. So yeah. I think that's that's the point, right? Yeah. For me, it's always you know, I want to have translations and I want to have mm -hmm. uh potential like you know versioning for the different versions. Sure, sure. All right. Um should we move on to the next thing? Yes, what's happening in the market, Salem? <laughs> Oh, I wish I could tell you what's happening in the markets. But in the meantime, I'm going to pretend that I know something and and uh, tell you uh, what's going on with the cloud markets. Uh, there's a recent article by um, Ron Miller at TechCrunch uh, that says that the market is forcing cloud vendors to relax data aggress. Now, if that doesn't make any sense to you, I'm going to explain what it is right now. Normally, when you adopt using a cloud framework, you'll put your data in that cloud, uh, and not cloud framework, but a, a cloud provider. So AWS, Azure, um, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, right? Any of those guys. When you, when you build your applications in there, often what you'll do is you'll either use a database that's already in that cloud area, or you'll use one of their block storage uh, systems like S3. And the thing is, the more of your data you put in, and this is also true of database providers like MongoDB Atlas, 
The more of your data that you put in, uh, the more of a lock-in it becomes, especially when they put an exit fee for taking your data out. Now, there are egress fees in two ways on these cloud services. One is, you know, trying to get your data back out. So if you've got terabytes, it can be very expensive to, to take it out. The other is just the transit of data uh, to the customer's browser or wherever it might be. So those fees add up also. Um, the ones that they're talking about here, and this is not a blanket revocation is what the article is talking about. What they're saying is like, yeah, you can get your data out if you want to leave that cloud provider. In the past, most people would say, well, it's just too much work and too much trouble to get my data out. I'll stay and I'll figure out how to make it work. But that's not a great business model because you have irritated customers. You have people that are not happy with you. And so the vendors are realizing this. But instead of just giving you an easier way out, you've got to you know, reach out to them personally and let them know that you want to do this. And then you've got to walk through hoops. So it's still not an easy uh, process to, to get your data back if you want to do that. But the more important driver on this, I think, and it's mentioned in this article, is that there are a number of companies that have what they call cross-cloud deployments. And getting their data from, say, for instance, AWS into um, Google Cloud, you have to pay those egress fees. And that is very expensive. And, and they're not saying, I'm taking my data and walking away. They're saying, for my business reasons, and it may be for business continuity, it may be for redundancy, it may be for a number of other reasons, um, they need to move data from one data center, one cloud to another, and they have to pay fees to do that. And that is operationally expensive. And so this is, I think, the key item or the key driver to making this relaxation policy um, or, or you know, backing off from the EOS fees um, relevant. So check the article out, read it, see if you come up with the same conclusions as I did on this. Again, as I said before, this is an article by Ron Miller from TechCrunch, it's at TechCrunch, and the article's title is, The Market is Forcing Cloud Vendors to Relax Data Agris fee Fees. And I think that's a little bit of clickbait, but you go judge for yourself. Yeah, I remember that part of GDPR, uh, mm -hmm. there is a clause that requires right. that you can export all of your data and all that stuff and import them easily. Yes, he does mention that in the article also, is that that as a driver also. So that actually could be the the bigger reason, but I think the business reason in terms of dollars and cents is is this notion of the you know cross-platform, cross-cloud uh, deployments that some big players have. But go on. I apologize. Yes, I just, yes. so so yeah, I, I think that's that's a big that's a big player, and that's also something that you know, even with, with my business, we have to start looking into how do we you know, provide a good export for all of the user data that they have and how do we uh, utilize the same thing but to import either back or import from other providers and all that stuff. But So right now we are small enough to uh, not really care that much about that. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh... Is there anything that users should be doing right now, Storyteller? Well, uh, if you are here and liked our stumbling and bumbling, or <laughs> uh, even if, if you like and made sense out of it, and uh, also for the chat, please give us a like to let everybody know that uh, this is something worth watching. Uh, it helps a lot in algorithm, uh, maybe as much as also typing in the chat, but you can do both. You can both like and type in the chat and you can do much more, but let's, for now, let's just, you know, please give us the like so that we can, you know, race to new heights in YouTube and uh, hopefully race in quality as well as we go forward. I just want to respond to Lori's comment over here about it's better to save in a hard drive at home. I think if you're like Priceline, you better have a, a big home, <laughs> a lot of hard drives. <laughs> Well, I, I think the, the general saying is that, you know, you should have 
course, in cloud, you should have your local copy, your local backup, yes. and you should have also a backup that is outside of your, uh, you know, let's say main location. So if right. something happens like, you know, you get flooded or the house catches on fire and burns down or something like that. Uh, but also it can depend on your uh, uh, data safety needs as well. Yeah. And I think that goes back to multi-cloud strategies for things like redundancy is exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about here. Um, I see that uh, we had uh, a few people show up. Hi, Lori. Hi, Simon. Hi, Min. It's good to see you guys today. Glad you could join us. Um, yeah, Lori, that 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 uh, that was a good one, you know. <laughs> and I think with that, I'm going to move on to our next story, which is, and all I'm really going to do here is highlight some things, um, which is uh, there are there's an article. I'm trying to remember who it's by. Give me one second here. And I will, I will pretend to tell you, but it's it's an article by um, John Jago, something yes, like that. Yes, I think so. Let me see. Yes, it's by John Jago. That's right, correct. And it's on his uh, website, and on, it's a personal blog, and he makes an observation about two open source projects that he believes have really great documentation. And one of the things he, he talks about, and, and, and he kind of like hits the points that we're trying to make here. And, and it's the reason why I wanted to, you know, include this article today as part of the discussion. And the title of the article is Two Open Source Projects with Great Documentation by John Jago. And he talks about ES Build and Redis. And one of the things that he mentioned is, you know, the plurality of the different types of documentation that you will find in the project and how how uh, how it works. So I'll quote here, through their readmes, change logs, architecture documents, and code comments, both projects explain their design in such a way that someone new to the code base can understand things where they are, how they are done, and why they are done that way. So it's not just documentation for the purpose of telling you what the thing is, but also explaining why the choices have been made for you know, those particular um, decisions. Um, I, think, I think it's, it's this is a really, really, and then of course he has a whole section here called why good documentation matters, and he's got an argument for it. So rather than sit here and try to argue out the uh, reasons, and we have kind of like given you a few of those points very early in the program, I would say go read this very excellent article, and um, and give it you know give it some thought, and then put some comments in the comments later on, after the program is done. Just come back here and let's continue this conversation. What do you think? Absolutely, I'm looking kind of forward to see what people are going to say about their favorite documentation as as uh, you're kind of looking to kind of unify the documentation for everything in relations to uh, meet your community packages. And yeah. that also being said, if you are interested in helping with that, you know, please feel free to reach out to me and we can get uh, you know, the efforts forward again. And I just want to remind everybody that Storytel and I are here this week, which is great. We're missing our friend Cooster. But Cooster had a little bit of a forethought, and he wanted to be part of the news today. So he sent in um, a video recording on a story that he looked at, and it regards signals. I'm going to play that now for you so you can check out what he has to say. Yeah, welcome to another news item. This time on the proposal for signals submitted to the TC39 in order to make signals becoming a part of the upcoming ECMA script standard once it's through the full cycle and this is interesting for us for the media community because basically we had some kind of a similar implementation with tracker in media 
And um, however, signals emerged over time quite often in many different frameworks. And I think the author's idea, and this is what he describes in the article a little bit further, is that there are multiple frameworks implementations and he gathered actually people from these frameworks um, to in order to give input and come up with some kind of a standard here. And this is interesting because maybe we will get signals as a first class citizen or as a, as a data type in that case in JavaScript. That would be totally interesting. And also the question arises then, what do we do with Meteor? Do we adopt this? Do we replace Tracker with it? Do we want to give input? what we know from Tracker. There is the TC39 organization repository called Proposals Signals, which also he opened basically, and um, on which he's working on, I think. That was at least what I was looking at. Yeah, there it is, I think. No, it's Daniel Ehrenberg. That's somebody else, I think, was it? <laughs> oh, that that's different. That's Rob Eisenberg. Um, anyway. The, there is this uh, repository and if there's anyone wants to contribute on that then you should take a look there's also already a polyfill which is quite interesting so you can even check that out on the signals polyfill and and take a look at the source take a look how they work on your end and Again, this is a harmonized version of all the inputs coming from these frameworks having their own kind of signal-like implementations or what they call signal. And then it describes like how the reactivity actually works under the hood. Like I think it's he described it as a push then pull model or pull then push model? No, push then pull push then pull model. So if you're interested in that and if you already peeked a little bit into how Tracker works, this is definitely worth to check out. And I think for us as a community, this is even more interesting from the point of what can we learn with the future of Tracker. I think there is also this whole asynchronity um, not 100% covered here. At least I still haven't seen any perfect async example I search or oh, there is something and that's interesting here um, they say signals are always synchronously available for ev uh, evaluation however it's frequently useful to have certain asynchronous processes and I think this is still in discussion because this is also on the part omitted for now so I don't feel bad if we as a community still haven't 100% figured out how everything is working as they don't as well. Um, anyway, let's keep a look on this uh, topic for a while and we will definitely let you know if there are any updates on that. And with that, I wish you a great weekend and goodbye. All right. Okay. Very, very exciting, I think. You know, there's a lot of talk about signals in a bunch of different places. As a matter of fact, I was looking at uh, Flask documentation in Python the other day, and uh, there was a section on signals, and I haven't had a chance to read that yet, but it just seems to be the thing. And, you know, isn't that really what Tracker has been all this time? Like, we've had what is signals, uh, you know, how, how different are they, Tracker and signals? Do you know? Do you have a sense? Well, I haven't had a chance to look that much into mm -hmm. signals. There are certain similarities. The API is, uh, of course, different because it's almost uh, a decade apart in sure. implementation and ideation. And uh, of course, it's trackers very much, you know, from bottom up for Meteor, while the right. signals are more general. So that, and that's also kind of brings me like, you know, question what, you know, once, you know, signals is there with right. what, what do we do with tracker and uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, 
in a way, I wouldn't be against moving completely to signals and archiving tracker because then we can just use you know the web standards. It makes the bundles smaller, makes it more interoperable with everything else. Yeah. So definitely do keep a close eye on and uh, yeah. Who knows? Does, maybe does... we can we can do a deep dive into it in the future. I think I think it's it's worth taking a look at. I was kind of. Curious if Lori has an opinion on it because Lori does a lot of experiments with new technologies when they come out, and uh, and he plays with it. I don't know if he's had a chance, so I don't know if you're still there in the chat, Lori. But if you are uh, and you have some opinion that you could share with us, please let us know. Uh, I don't have any experience with signals other than you know it's sort of like you go to a party and you run into that person that you you know looks interesting. Haven't you had a chance to ch chat with for a while, right? Because mm -hmm. there just hasn't really been a reason to. But you see them over and over often enough that you think, oh, you know, I, I think one day I'm going to just try to make a, a chance to to spend some time with that person and, and get to know them. And I think this is how Signals is for me right now. It's like one of those things that we've run into many times now. Uh, we're seeing it mentioned over and over again in different frameworks and different contexts. And now it's like, okay, maybe we should do a deep dive and really discover what's meaningful about it. And in a lot of ways, I haven't had a reason to talk to that person, so to speak, if we keep with the metaphor, because we have Tracker. And Tracker seems to do what Signals appears to do. And I say appears and seems because I don't know for sure because I haven't spent any time with, with uh, Signals. I'm just making assumptions about how interesting that person is and you know what I'm going to get out of that relationship if I put the effort in but in this case you know I could be totally wrong I probably am okay so where are we now well we are back to meet here kind of closing this circle uh -huh. and I want to take a look on meteor 3 documentation as you okay. can see, it's uh, very different from what we are used to. It's a new documentation. Uh, Gabriel Gruber has been working on migrating to this new system. Uh, and it's very neat. They also take, I would say, our kind of advantage, as you can see, with this nice transitioning effect of the web of the transition API. So a lot of uh, cool stuff happening there. But you can expect there to have uh, everything that you know from the current uh, documentation. And of course, uh, more stuff as well, uh, specifically in relation to Meteor 3. So all of that is still available. Uh, and I think it's you know good for everyone to check it out. And I kind of want to quickly show you how you can find it. Uh, you know, if you ever are in doubt, always find out the release 3.0 pull request where you can uh, see all the details of what's happening on. And you can also find here, there is a preview docs, which goes to uh, v3-docs.meteor.com. And that's where you can find the new documentation with all the you know, maybe maybe still some things missing, but I think everything has, at this point has been migrated over, so you can find that. Uh, one big thing to kind of realize, this does not uh, affect the guide. At least I have not seen anything that the guide is going to be migrated at this point. That might be coming in the future, uh, but not yet. So the guide will still be in the old setup as well. So... It's a try. I really much like that. I have the dark theme. So all of that is there and it's uh, all modern looking and everything and hopefully should be uh, easier to maintain and update and do all this stuff uh, as compared to the old Hexo design, which we kind of lost, uh, say, the, the original person who uh, developed it, uh, left a long time ago, and then 
nobody really stepped up to maintain it and upgrading is not as simple as as we would like to sure and there's the also the big thing is that the search is now uh fully working which has some issues on the old documentation side so yeah. bright future or it's going to be the dark team future ahead for the <laughs> documentation well yeah um we have i don't really have a lot to add here other than you know one of the things i think that we really need to be careful about is because we are a, a, a mature project we've been around for over 10 years now that there is a lot of documentation that when you do a search uh, isn't really relevant that comes up um now this is within the api documentation right or or mm -hmm. within yes. the user documentation so it's mm -hmm. only going to return stuff that is in context correct yeah so that's yeah. that's so far let me uh I think that's how it should be. Let me kind of spin up the guide here and see if I can get something from there. So we have change log here, which mm -hmm. is if I okay. So we have the current change log. So yeah. that's still here on the new side, three point zero migration. So we don't have anything from the guide at this point in time. Okay. So the other thing is when we tr uh, transition over, and I apologize because I was looking ahead on the schedule while you were speaking. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry if you've mentioned this before, but I was curious. We have had um, references to older version documentation going back to, um, I want to say, like uh, just before version one, or maybe it's no version one point something, right? in in the current documentation will we have that in the new documentation yes so looking at this if you click here down here on the change log pre 2.0 uh, it kind of points you back to the docs okay uh, to the old docs so i am i'm assuming what's going to happen here uh probably for Kind of everybody's sake, the old documentation mm -hmm. uh, is going to remain here uh, in mm -hmm. under some sort of subdomain. Okay. For people to check and forward, we'll, we'll be going forward with the new documentation look and everything. Uh, part of that, my assumption is because uh, I am not seeing here any drop down for right. versions. I think that that's going to come in the future and i was talking with uh, gabriel gruba but i don't mm -hmm. remember exactly so i think there is also going to be an option to translate the documentation in the future as well so which, which i'm pretty excited about oh absolutely yeah it's great to see it going forward it's great to see a new <clears throat> face to it and having uh good tools behind it but i also want to make sure that we don't lose out information because I think you, uh, myself, and Cooster a while back had done a an informal inventory of some apps that were out there by using one of these uh, sites like Built With or something mm -hmm. and found that there were uh, several uh, production sites out there that were not current. And in terms of Meteor, some of them working yeah. on with very, very early versions of Meteor, which I think speaks to the fact that if you have an app and it's running and it's not broken and it's doing its job and you haven't had a need to update, then great. Um, it means that that version of Meteor works very well for you. Um, so those folks who might run into an issue later on, uh, if there isn't the documentation available to them, it really becomes a very frustrating experience uh, for, for them and their applications and Yikes. So it just I just want to bring it up as a point because you know, although it's a lot of extra stuff to carry around and it's old stuff, um, it sometimes is necessary stuff. Yeah. Oh, then we go we go into 
how do we optimize uh, mm -hmm. optimize it for search? Uh, you know, uh, right. also kind of remove it maybe from search because we don't want this to be, uh, especially later on, with, with tutorials and everything to be searchable or yep. from the outside, so that we don't have the old information out there, some to be able to found. Uh, speaking of optimization, I have for you now here a useful resource which I found. Uh, I don't know how if I found it probably by some Twitter post or something, uh -huh. and that is optimizing JavaScript for fun and for profit. Yeah, that was a goes... story that that was a story I found uh, about two weeks ago, and um, we pushed off for this week. Yes, it's yes. awesome. So yeah, I think that that's that may have it gone. So definitely highly recommend looking here at you know people smarter than me or at least more in the weeds of all the details yeah. looking on different uh, performances and what is better to use for data structures and you know I like here where was it uh, you know be careful about strings and there was yeah. uh, no yeah caching prefetching uh -huh. So interesting, but one thing I really liked and uh, about this using, well, I haven't, I still have to really go into much details, but there was, it was something yeah. in the beginning. Let me quickly find it. Yes, here, avoid array object methods, which mm -hmm. I found very interesting that, you know, instead of having, you know, m using maps or yep. using, uh, you know, filter, reduce, all these awesome or uh, for each functions. If you just do a for loop, uh, you know, kind of the imperative way to run through a array, it's faster. So that is, uh, that's kind of a bit surprising uh, for me. Uh, and you can, you can kind of learn all about it here, why that is and, you know, especially if you are looking then in to get into all the uh, details yeah. about, or like if you're looking to you know, improving like for milliseconds and all those stuff, then this is where you really, you should be paying attention and uh, improving on that. For me, for example, with this, you know, maps and everything, I have moved, you know, to for, for loops uh, a lot of places, especially when it comes to async, because uh, in the for loops we can, Run async and it becomes a bit complicated in the you know maps for each and all those other uh, functions. So highly recommend it. Uh, this is generally for JavaScript, and who knows maybe in the future we'll also do for React and other things. It's it's a really interesting article in the sense that this person um, I don't know the name. It's uh, just a username Ram Grok, right or Ram Grok. Mm. I don't know how you say it, but What's what's really you know interesting with this is the focus on on the layout of your data and thinking about how it maps to memory and thinking about how you, you know memory is accessed right or the data is accessed mm -hmm. in memory uh, when it's completely random versus when you kind of have a structure in your mind and so I was reading this article and I was thinking this is really like how a C developer thinks you know. Because you have yeah. to think about like, you know, your, you know, how much memory you're malloking and and uh, you know what your structs are going to be like if you're going to use some static data structure instead or static memory, and it's 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 kind of cool that way. The there is this section that he has on eval, which again, as you said, people smarter than me, right? People, yeah, I. You know, we've always been told not to use eval, and I'm not even sure is eval even allowed anymore in the language. Uh, depends. There are certain ways how you can disable it. For example, on the front end. Okay. So eval is definitely around. Uh, Meteor uses it a lot, so I do re recall that you know in Meteor you cannot actually disable it because then you would kind of disable Meteor. Oh, interesting. Um, so. At least on the on the front end, uh, but I might be mis maybe yeah. mistaken with something else. But I uh, that I think it's evolved that that's the issue. 
I just remember like this being a rule from like, you know, JavaScript, the bad parts, right? <laughs> where, yeah. where it's recommended not to, uh, by the way, that's, that's an old book. I don't know if it's still relevant anymore. I've got to go take a look at mine and see whether or not uh, the language has moved past a lot of the recommendations there. But, uh, but he does have this thing about uh, using eval. And uh, the minute I saw that, I, I just said, okay, all right, there's something going on here that, you know, I've got to, I've got to spend some time thinking about because my immediate reaction is don't use eval. I see an article that says use eval and I start wondering about the value of it. But because there is a lot going on here that um, I would have to try for myself to have a better understanding of, uh, you know, I, I want to give this author a bit more, um, uh, you know, um, <sighs> What is the word I'm trying to use? I want to I want to give him, you know, give him the credit, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, just sort of like, you know, let it breathe for a little bit, and then come back to it. Just you know, um, give him a chance, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, so, I think for most cases here, mm -hmm. um, yeah, he actually goes over the obviously usual warning. It's about evil apply. Don't trust user input. Sanitize mm -hmm. anything that gets passed into evil evil code and don't create any access as possibility. It's also note that some environments don't allow access to eval, such as browser pages with CSP. Yeah, uh, which is, yeah. Yeah, so uh, let me kind of move here over here a little bit. So that that's like one thing that you, in the case of Meteor, this is allowed mm -hmm. because uh, Meteor uses it for internal processes and all that stuff. Uh, in general, I would, um, so especially because of security, yeah. Uh, don't uh, use it unless you know very well what you're doing here or making yeah. specifically performance uh, optimization and you do all those checks. But then uh, you have to so compare. You're you're, you're, you're saying that what he's saying. I, I apologize. You're saying what he's saying is, um, if you're going to use it, you better know what you're doing. Yes. Okay. All right. I would say, especially especially in the case of you know, eval, because that one could have mm -hmm. potentially disastrous security consequences yeah. if you are not careful. So you know, eval is yeah. like you know high level optimization, as you said. You know, right? Check everything. Uh, you know, especially if it includes inputs, sanitize all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then, but then you know, is this you know if. Uh, if you then need to do all of this to get to the eval, uh, you know, hopefully you're like doing that for for in in general as as you have it now. But if if you need to include this as an extra mm -hmm. compared to your previous one, where you can do it without worrying until say the next step about it, yeah. uh, then I think there's there can be some, or maybe you don't have to worry because it's just you know locally for client. Uh, yeah. Then, then you also have to take into account what what is going to be the performance impact of including uh, those additional checks if you can do without them and all that stuff. So, but that that's what I call it, like you know, high yeah. high level because you need to know, uh, kind of have the big picture, know what you're doing, okay. all that stuff. I think what we're going to do because in the interest of time, and I have limited time because I have to get on the road in a bit. Yeah. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to skip past uh, two other things that we normally do, and uh, we'll try to do those as shorts, which is the conference listings that are coming up and CFPs. And we're going to just go right on over to another section that we have, which is uh, understanding media. And I, before I do that, um, if there's anything else that you want to chat about, why don't you fill the time with that? Because I've got to look to see that I have um, a banner for. Uh... Yeah, we have here from Jan. Mm -hmm. Hello, Jan. Uh, not, 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 not my brother, but considered my third brother, Jan Pilgenrader. <laughs> uh, if you remember, was it? About two years back, we the three Jans we met uh, in Germany. Uh, went for a sushi together. Had had a great time. Uh, he said using uh, LLMs is like using eval on everything. 
page. <laughs> it's a very funny way to put it. Uh, so that's uh, that is uh, I would say really nice, nice, nice slip. But I kind of find like with LMS, it's uh, how should I say like brute forcing a password in a way. Yes, yeah. from many of the description of how it works. Uh, so that's that. So uh, in discussing Meteor, uh, what will we be talking about, Alem? Well, so, and here's the thing. So what I'll do is before we get to the end of this, I'm going to give you guys a coupon code. We are in Understanding Meteor. We have a new, we have a segment. We've had the segment for a while called Understanding Meteor. And I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago that we're going to start, um, this segment is actually going to be sponsored by Galaxy. And Galaxy is the cloud service. You guys might know it right now as Meteor Cloud, but it is the cloud service that is run by Meteor Software. And that is where you can host your applications that you write in Meteor, and they make it really simple to do so. We have our first bit of content that we're going to share with you. It's actually a walkthrough on deploying applications. And Kuster was really nice to put it together before uh, he, you know, he, well, before the program, because he wasn't able to make it with us today. So he was going to actually walk through building the application and then putting it up and deploying it and showing your different deployment options. He provided a very concise um, uh, video that, that shows us, and I'm going to play that for you now. All right, so give me one second here and let's get it up. In Media.js, you have plenty options for deployment. You can build and manually install on any target infrastructure you like, but you have to manage reverse proxy certificates and the domain, plus APM and so on. There is also a tool called MediaRub, which is free and community managed, and it can help you to automate this process. Nevertheless, you still have to manage the deployment, the images, the reverse proxy, certificates and domain on your own. Meteor itself comes with a built-in command that's called Meteor Deploy. It allows you to deploy your application to Galaxy, the hosted infrastructure by Meteor Software, the team behind the Meteor Software. Let's log in to Galaxy and see what it offers. Go to galaxy.meteor.com and enter the website to sign in with your Meteor Cloud credentials. And then you can continue to your dashboard. There are two main options for deployment to Galaxy. This is deployment from Git using push to deploy and using the command line interface, which we want to cover for today. There is also an option to deploy an app for free using the free tier, including a MongoDB setup, which we try out now. Open your application and make sure it's running locally fine without any errors. Make sure your tests run and so on. And then go to the project route in your command line and enter Meteor Deploy, then the website or the URL name as a subdomain of MeteorApp.com and then enter minus minus settings equals settings.json, that's the path to our settings file, minus minus free for the free tier and minus minus mongo for the mongo integration. Then your app is locally built, the app code is minified. Then it's uploaded to Galaxy. Galaxy will build native images, will install your application, and then deploy your application. Once this is done, you will receive a new Mongo URL because you issued the minus minus Mongo command. Copy this URL and save it somewhere where it's safe and not published to the, anyone. You can also use this for your app settings in the future as, de as described here. Now let's go over to our application dashboard and see what we can look at. 
back on Galaxy, we can see that the app is now listed under the applications list and we can open it to see what, every, what is there in the overview. For example, we can see connections, CPU, memory and containers and also the running performance for a certain period. The CPU usage over this period and the memory usage. We also can see which kind of containers are deployed. For our application, this is the tiny container, which is part of the free tier. If we want to see some details of the deployment or debug some errors, we can look in the logs. There are also real-time logs and there is versioning in case we deploy multiple versions of our app. There's also the settings for further customization, but this is nothing we want to cover for today. Instead, we want to go to our app. So we go to twim-update-meteorapp.com and then take a look on our uptime monitor. As you can see, it's already running for quite some time and it's updating each five seconds. So there it is. This is how we deployed our free app on the Meteor Galaxy. Oops. I'm sorry, guys. I'm having a little bit of a, a glitch a here. <laughs> so, so that was that was the uh, that was the segment. Um, I want to share with you guys that <clears throat> the folks at Media Software have been very generous. Uh, for if you want to try this out yourself, uh, there is a free tier. But if you have um, a production app that you want to use and you want to make sure that the app is always running and doesn't have any uh, latency, uh, then you might want to try one of the other, um, uh, the non-free items where one of the limitations of the free tier is that uh, there is a cold start issue with your application. It's not always running. It runs for a while, then it shuts down. And so if somebody hasn't come to the application, they're going to have some time that they have to wait for the application to get loaded and then to run. So if you have something that is that, that you want people to be able to get to and have a good user experience, you want to use one of the paid features. And you could do a paid tiny, a compact. And what were some of the other sizes? Um, compact, standard, double. It goes up with the resources. Yeah. So all of that is. Uh, available. You also have the option to Pro, which you get APM. Uh, there is, I'll quickly answer, there's a question about Mongo integration in Ad Galaxy that is only for free tier yep. at this moment. Uh, there have been hints that it's going to be available in the future uh, as well. So uh, for, for everybody. So yep. stay tuned on that. And there has been there's a question about if Galaxy is available in Germany yet. Not yet. Uh, it's right now only in Ireland for the EU region. Uh, but uh, there are some rumbling of potentially opening more uh, zones. And I am privy to some, let's just say, additional information because if things go well, uh, then we'll, we might be opening. Uh, zone uh, thanks to my company and uh, partnerships we have with uh, other companies to work on something. So yeah, uh, that so, will sadly not be in Europe, but uh, stay tuned on more on that in coming month or so. So Kelly um, had mentioned that uh, Galaxy has had a free tier for a while now, and that's true. It has um, more than a year. And that's actually not the point that we're making here. The point is we're just demonstrating how easy it is to you know, push an application to Galaxy. You have a number of different options of how you can deploy an app. Galaxy is one of them. In this, in this video, we, we did the, um, the free tier uh, because there is a limit on the size of the videos that we can put up. Cooster uh, did not go into a longer version of this, which would have shown putting a, a more um, uh, a larger app or an app that that would need um, full-time resources and using the paid version. So what we have here is this offer for $60 of Galaxy credits. If you decide that you're going to 
try using Galaxy for your professional apps. There's a free $60 worth of credits that you can get if you were to take that link and go to it. Um, entirely up to you. I would suggest that you give it a try. It's worth it to see. And then, of course, uh, there, are, there are some new things that are happening to Galaxy soon. And as we get the information, we will share it with you in upcoming episodes. And I think that's it for this segment for now. What do you say? Yeah, that's uh, all I have. There are some exciting, uh, I think, news coming up for Galaxy. Let me see if I can actually find it because uh, uh, Galaxy, as you've seen it here, has been looking like this for well, pretty much since the beginning. But there has been, um, let me see, there's been, could say, quote, leak, unquote, of uh, the future. And yeah, here we go. I found it from... Oh, I, I just have to mention, uh, and I apologize about this. I forgot that there is a, a, um, a field on that form. So if we can go back to it for a second, mm -hmm. called coupon code. And I need to give you that coupon code. So the coupon code, I will put it up on the... Um, on the screen in a second, this is what will give you the $60 is dispatches 60. So when you get to that very bottom field at the bottom there, it, it asks for a coupon code. That is the coupon code that you will get, that you'll put in and it'll give you your $60 um, of credits to Galaxy. You have to enter a credit card. You don't have to do anything else, but they need to be able to attach it to some billing. So um, that's how like all these cloud operators work. This is how this one works also. Um, and again, you know, neither of us work for media software, but this is a feature that they have extended to us to share with you. So we're happy to do so. If you can get some benefit from it, we're really thrilled about it too. All right. Yes. And yeah, here is a quick preview of uh, how it's going to look all snappy and everything in the future. So, Very nice. Yeah, changes are coming and also dark theme, finally. <laughs> that is nice. And does that include Monty APM yet or is it still um, using? I, I think um, once this gets deployed, it's going to include uh, Monte APM, but I cannot make that guarantee because I do not know okay. what the background of those things so, maybe somewhere in here. If you watched an episode, I believe, where we had Fred on, and I think that was sometime in January, I want to say, that so you go back and watch it. Uh, Fred, share some information about what's coming with Meteor. One is that Meteor Cloud is now Meteor Galaxy. Uh, it's now Galaxy again. It had been Galaxy before. They changed to Meteor Cloud. Now it's back to Galaxy. Uh, another is that they're going to be swapping out um, their version of Kadira APM with Monty APM, which is, I, I think, um, and in all fairness to the guys at Meteor Software, I think uh, Monty APM is actually a better product. And and they're going to be uh, including that in future versions of Galaxy. So those are two things that he had announced and shared. So I'm not, I'm not saying something that Fred didn't say. And so it's something to be excited about and to look forward to. Indeed. Right. So that all set. Let me check my notes. Yeah, I think we're down to the end of this all. We we did say that we were going to talk a little bit uh, in an open discussion about this concept of self-documenting code. Yes. And I'm joke at the beginning uh, here that you, know, you can just read the code. You don't need any docs. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, approach of some some developers yeah. just read the code and yeah that might be nice for a quick uh, you know say function that's pretty mm -hmm. clear what it's doing but at a certain point um things just are not that say simple uh and 
Sometimes, you know, even naming things is very difficult. So I'm in the camp that, or, or also many people I've heard have been talking, oh, you have type scripts, you have all the types there, you know, what's going to return, you know, what's what's your problem? Why do you want yeah. documentation? And, uh, you know, even with type scripts, uh, you know, at the very least, I think sometimes you need to have JS docs where you have at least some description. Mm -hmm. uh, as once we go beyond the non-trivial stuff. And you have to realize that uh, not everybody is the master programmer that you are that writes perfect code yeah. uh, all the time. That's so clear and amazing. Uh, so for me, it's, you know, respect, you know, JS docs at the very minimum, because mm -hmm. then you can Kind of sub document, but it needs to be not just oh, I just add his JS docs and have the editor fill out the types and everything for me. Uh, descriptions and especially the more complex or larger your app gets, the more descriptions and uh, samples are needed. At least that, so that's that's where I stand. Yeah, you know, I, I've had when I was an engineering manager, I, I've had uh, developers like tell me this in the past, and and I struggled to find a good argument um on this and, and when i was working in companies that were startups where it was fresh code base um some of that kind of made sense in, in the sense that you know they were creating code for the first time and they were really trying to um make an effort to have their code be uh legible in the sense that they had you know well-formed variables they had um you know classes that that um, you know had good naming structure and so on, and also had uh, good structures in terms of the kinds of methods that they had and so on. So it was, you know, in a sense, it, you could kind of make sense of what was going on. But I have said before that when I started my career in software development, and again, I'm not saying I'm a great developer or anything. As a matter of fact, I did it for a while, then I went into management. And so you should take everything with a grain of salt. But when I started, I started out as a bug developer, meaning I came into a team where there was already established code. There wasn't a ton of greenfield work going on. And when there was greenfield work, it was given to the most senior developers. And so when you came in, you cut your teeth on fixing bugs, um, doing enhancements to existing code. And I will tell you that I had code that I worked with, and I remember there was a language called Spitball where I had to rewrite an entire Spitball program uh, in C. And it was a pain because there was no documentation that kind of explained what was going on. Now, those were more memory restrictive languages, so you couldn't really write very long and descriptive um, variable names and so on. Um, but one of the things that I ended up doing and one of the practices that we ended up doing was every um, code module that we would write, we would have you know a header description of what it was about and why we wrote about it. And I think that actually is the part that I couldn't put my finger on before, but has been mentioned to me by others who are smarter than me um, about why we need documentation. And it's not so much the what, it's the why. It's what's the context behind why this piece of code got written or why this module was included or why you took this approach rather than some other approach. Um, you know, those things get missed. And if you rely on somebody else to intuit it or to be smart enough to figure it out, you slow down the entire organization. And this is where documentation really makes the most sense in terms of code documentation rather than just self-documenting code is that if you have to sit down and try to figure it out, nine times out of 10, you're gonna make assumptions and mistakes. It's like human language, right? If it's not explicit, then there's a lot that you bring to the table that may be just wrong. And it inevitably you know, confounds the issue. And this happens when you have code that you have to maintain uh, code bases that have been around for a while. I mean, walk into any project where you've had to take code that had been written like eight, nine years ago that you've either had to upgrade or maintain or, or um, you know, port. And you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's 
the better documented that that code is, the easier it is, and, it, and, and this is never easy, but it's easier, I believe, to do the job. And and that's that's where I come with this. So uh, I see that there's been some chat in the in the in the um, in the yes. in the let, live let chats. me address it. Uh, Ming says, you know, why not both JS docs and TypeScript? Uh, that's what that's what I was implying. Sure. You know, for me, the first step, if you have it, is uh, it's TypeScript, uh, and then you add to it uh, JS docs. Uh, primarily, you know, if you have TypeScript, you usually don't need the JS doc types, but you uh, you can really use the additional fields that JS docs allow you. So for descriptions, you know, the locus is a client or server function and uh, other similar uh, similar things. Uh, Kelly is not too happy about using both, but... <laughs> uh, Dude, these, these Kelly, are choices, Kelly right? is the edge lord here. <laughs> I mean, these are... <laughs> These are choices that we can make. We don't we don't have to do it. But the the point that I'm making is that if you're concerned about um, having other people who might have to take over your code and read it and so on, you think about the longevity of your code. And that's the other thing too is that projects are never static. That the thing that you produce with software is never going to be the same. You know, five years, six months. 10 years down the road, it's going to start as one thing. It's going to evolve into, you know, some version of that original thing. Sometimes it mutates entirely. Um, so it's one of those things where if you have the intentions documented someplace, it, it makes a lot more sense to the person that comes in and looks at it. So I think it's just having some sympathy for mm -hmm. your fellow developers, you know, what is Kelly saying? I leave all my code. Wait. So I, I leave I all joking, my code right? undocumented. So when I leave, uh, <laughs> I know they don't really miss me. <laughs> so that's that. Uh, that is the um, that is the case for uh, what do they call that? Um, you know, you you become indispensable, right? Yeah. The the problem though with that is uh, kind of the managerial uh, approach in recent years have been okay if if you have a could say superstar developer mm -hmm. and like say other four developers then fire the uh superstar developer and maybe hire two more regular developers uh that will do uh you know, the documenting and everything for the longevity of the code in your company so that you don't you don't have that problem specifically and I also today big big thing is that with documentation, as Ming pointed out here, uh, co mm -hmm. uh, GitHub Copilot and similar, uh, you know, AI tools uh, are pretty good at looking at the function and describing what it does. So you can kind of get, I would say, very far with just recommendations from Copilot to put in there and then adjusting it as needed. So even less, yeah, less less uh, things to think about. What was it? Oh, it says Min's hot take. <laughs> well, Kelly just sees it that the job security, but job security exactly. Yeah. My counter is that uh, that is, I think the general advice from what I've saw, you know, to managers and so on is to actually fire these superstar developers and everything uh, <laughs> because of the issues that they can cause like this. Sure. I think, I think I, you know, again, as I said before, it's just being empathetic to your fellow developers and people down the, it's really having sort of like the long view of where this is going to go. Um, I have a colleague of mine that is a professor at, at a university and she is uh, working with, um, with uh, COBOL recently. And I think it's related to COBOL projects that are sort of still out there that need developers. So, yeah. I, uh, Kelly, I, I know that that's a little bit of sarcasm and so on, but that, but I think that you're pointing out what the thinking is, is why some people don't put documentation in. 
is because they they find that there might be some job security or so on, and they want to make sure that uh, they are the holders of the key, so to speak, um, that they are indispensable, and they have job security. So with that, um, I think I, you know, we could go on and on with this. I don't really want to dwell on this again. Uh, so hang on, I'm just going to show you the conversation. Kelly says I don't actually think that way. Just to be clear, and then Min wrote. Ha ha, I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to tell you guys, if you get a chance at the program to come in uh, during the live stream and participate in the chat, there is a lot that's happening in there that you don't see. They are having a good time in the chat. So it's a fun reason to show up and, and be part of that. I'm going to um, pop over now and talk a little bit about you know, some of the issues that we always see here, and we were talking about some of them, we'll bring them up again next week, um, is this issue about properly supporting open source. And one of the ways that you can support open source projects like Meteor um, or others, depending on who it is, is if your developers, the folks that are working on those open source projects include a sponsorship link of any kind. It could be Patreon. It could be GitHub uh, sponsorships. It could be a personal page. Uh, they're, they're indicating to you that, you know, there are a couple of things that you can do. Just they want some feedback on whether or not it's worth their time and effort, what the effort that they're, they're doing. Um, small, uh, you know, small gestures of appreciation can go a long way to making sure that the hard work that's put in is well received and so in some cases like our uh two yons the yon brothers they have github sponsorship pages and if you are so inclined there are a couple of things you can do at those github pages one is you can go and give them a star for the projects and and for for just star them right let them know that you appreciate the fact that they work on open source projects and the other is you can also, if you have the ability to do so, is make a contribution to them. Um, allow them to binge on caffeine so they stay up more and work like slaves to give you free software. Just remember that this free software is really not free. It's done on their time and their dime. And not just these yawns, but anybody else whose open source projects you use and benefit from. So just keep that in mind. It's really a mindset that we need to have is that open source software is really not free software. It's done from people who believe that they need to contribute in some way, have something to contribute. And if you benefit from it, the right thing to do is to find a way to make sure that these folks are supported both professionally, emotionally. Um, I want to say spiritually, but I don't think that that applies here. But if, if that's something that you can help them with, go say a prayer and let them know that uh, that you're thinking of them. All right. And with that, um, I think, Storyteller, you've got some things to add here. Yes. Uh, please, you know, speaking of stars and everything, subscribe to our channel. And we there are some shorts that have been created. Uh, a while ago or constantly being created jan is working on them and uh, having quite a blast yeah with them so you can check out uh some interesting moments and uh learning moments from previous episodes so that those are our shorts that we are constantly producing or Jan yeah, specifically <laughs> jan's been putting shorts out in the last couple of weeks here so um and he's got uh, new ones coming up so check them out and let us know whether or not, you know, give those a thumbs up or, you know, uh, let us know whether or not uh, you think that these are worth doing. Uh, if you think that you could do a better one, we leave our episodes open for remixing. So you can go in and make your own shorts and then show them to us if you want to. Uh, you know, what, what else could they do uh, to participate in this? So uh, as we have kind of showcased through the uh, through the show, we have a live stream. So if you come live, you know, participate in the chat. A lot of fun, a lot of additional information. Uh, sometimes we have more time to feature it, sometimes don't. But even if you come after the show, 
You can still leave a comment and we can continue the discussion uh, afterwards. Feel free, you know, to, uh, you know, tag us or add us uh, in the comments as well. Uh, so that we get the notification and can respond uh, faster. So, yeah, many we read all the contribute. comments. We read all the comments. So just, just so that you know, we don't have that many right now. So we can read them and we do. So, yeah. A golden opportunity, if I say so myself. Exactly. All right. And what's coming up next week, Jan? So let me check in here. So if my notes are correct, Alain, we'll be looking mm -hmm. at our Bain, the AI, uh, construction time again, building with AI. All right. So that's what we have at least uh, well, that, scheduled that, for Friday. And, and that dovetails with your 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 uh, stream on Monday, correct? Yes, because on Monday, I will be looking on my personal stream, AI and the future of the industry and society mm -hmm. in general, looking up what's, uh, you know, what does the future hold? I will have share some of my uh, ideas. Uh, on on those topics i hope that you can join me for the uh discussion and uh, we'll look and try to kind of see it's one of my streams where i'm more you could say philosophical and sci-fi looking towards into the future uh, to see what you know the future potentially could hold we'll try to make some prediction most of them will probably be wrong but you know even planning or kind of looking for for the what what the future can hold uh, it's part of possible preparation and mitigation of negative impacts that can come along with new technology so um uh your friend german jan uh just made a comment that you look like sheldon cooper um <laughs> <laughs> a low-res version of him and uh now kelly has um, just got uh learn to farm now we're all getting put out of work <laughs> all right guys uh and with that i think we're gonna say have a great weekend cheers